pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Thomas Breyer. Dr. Breyer is a professor in the School of Public Administration. Uh, his bio is in your program. He is uh, very engaged in the community and this topic and working with the, uh, the community to uh, leading forward, acting on our values is very much what he is about. So Dr. Breyer, I am turning the program over to you. Thank you, uh, Marianne, and uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, it is uh, and good afternoon to our friends and colleagues in South Africa. I'll say a little bit more uh, to you in just a moment. Um, I hope you don't mind. I've adjusted my camera. I hope the, it, it looks all right. Uh, it feels wholly unnatural to give something called a keynote address in a, from a seated position. Uh, so I've, uh, I've adjusted my camera and, uh, and I'm standing. Hopefully it doesn't look like I'm looking on over you or on top of you or about to jump into you. Uh, but this uh, feels a little bit more natural for me for the role that I have here today. Um, and so my good morning to everybody. My thanks to Marianne and to the organizing committee for this conference. Uh, it's uh, to, to organize a virtual conference uh, is certainly a uh, an ambitious thing these days, uh, as, as there are a lot of moving pieces and components that uh, need to be tested, retested, verified, validated before we're 99% sure that everything's going to go off without a hitch. Uh, so my thanks to the committee, my thanks to Justin Miller for working tirelessly to make sure the tech works and to the whole team uh, and putting this together. Uh, also, a special welcome uh, today to a, a group. I don't know how many are with us. Maybe you can type into the chat box if you're here from Stellenbosch University in South Africa. Uh, I have the pleasure to be part of a teaching team uh, in a postgraduate diploma in leadership in the Stellenbosch School of Business uh, and uh, uh, specifically teaching uh, part of the, the nonprofit concentration of this postgraduate diploma. Uh, and uh, I was uh, very happy to extend the invitation to join this conference uh, to, to uh, members of this group, to students in this program, practitioners, nonprofit practitioners in South Africa, uh, so they can join us in the learning. And, and I hope this is maybe the beginning of opportunity for us to uh, link uh, with the, the nonprofit professionals uh, and uh, this program in Stalinbosch in a, in a more formalized way uh, over the years. Uh, so welcome uh, to our friends in uh, Stellenbosch and, and in South Africa. You know, when I was preparing for these uh, remarks uh, in the past couple of weeks, we of course passed a, uh, a date on the calendar which is etched in uh, world history, and, and I refer to September 11th, 2001. We passed the uh, 19th anniversary or the 19th year following the September 11th attacks. At the time, I was living in uh, the Washington, D.C. area. I was working for a nonprofit organization called the Council for Excellence in Government. Uh, and uh, on that particular morning, uh, I was driving from a very early morning meeting in Baltimore uh, at the Annie E. Casey Foundation uh, to uh, work on a, a grant that, that my team and I had focusing on uh, child well being and, and leadership development for, for childhood. Uh, well-being practitioners in the government and nonprofit sector. Uh, and my colleague and I were driving from Baltimore to, uh, to Washington when, when the news broke of, of the attack that was happening. This was the beginning in the DC area of a very stressful couple of years. Uh, about one week after the September 11th uh, terrorist attacks, we began in the DC area to receive uh, or uh, offices and post offices in the DC area began to receive uh, mail with anthrax inside. Uh, and I remember very distinctly uh, going into my office at the Council for Excellence in Government and seeing uh, the, uh, the front office staff with their masks and their gloves opening the mail very carefully for fear that there might be anthrax inside the envelope. It was a very stressful time. And then about one year later in the DC area, we had another scare. Uh, and some of you uh, may remember this from the news at that time, uh, the DC area sniper attacks. This was a situation in which 
uh, random people in random places at gas stations and parking lots and shopping center uh, parking lots, uh, uh, just in, uh, walking down the street in front of a park, random people in the DC, Maryland, Virginia suburbs uh, in, the, in the DC region uh, were randomly shot and killed. But nobody knew where the shots were coming from. There was a sniper that was hidden somewhere. Uh, and uh, the, the early news reports, based on eyewitness testimony, suggested that we should be on the lookout for a white van or a white truck of some kind. Because every time there was a shooting, a witness reported that they saw a white van or they saw a white truck. So at the time, I was going to a gas station. I stood at my car. I was pumping gas. And I look around and I see I'm surrounded by nothing but white trucks and white vans. You'd be surprised if you go outside and walk into the street after this, uh, this conference or during a break, how many white vans or white trucks actually exist on our roadways. They're everywhere. So of course, witnesses saw them after every shooting. Uh, the thing that, that got me very nervous and got me running, at the time I was a graduate student in a master's in public administration program at George Washington University. Uh, and uh, I uh, was uh, living uh, in the Maryland suburbs. I was uh, about uh, 30 minutes drive from the last uh, metro station uh, in the, on the DC metro line. So I walked out of the metro station at about 10 p.m. Uh, and it was dark, the lot was empty, it was surrounded by woods, and the parking lot was right off the entrance to the highway. And I thought in my mind, this is a perfect spot for a sniper to be wait, laying in wait. And I wasn't alone in that. There were maybe four or five other passengers who were also going to the end of the line on the last train of the night. And they too were very scared. So one by one, we exited the cover of the metro station and ran zigzag to our cars, thinking if there is a shooter out there, which there might be, maybe there's a high probability that there is, the best way we can survive this is to run zigzag and make ourselves a very difficult target, running zigzag back and forth, back and forth until we get to our car. And as I was reflecting on September 11th and the anthrax attacks and this idea of running zigzag to avoid the sniper, I thought, you know, this is basically what we tend to do as organizations and as people in times of high stress and high uncertainty. We run zigzag, right? We run from fire to fire to fire to fire, hyper aware of everything around us, but laser focused on absolutely nothing, right? Hyper aware of everything around us, alert to all the possible dangers and threats that might befall us at any moment, but laser focused on nothing. And that kind of hyper awareness without focus is positively exhausting. Whether we are in the nonprofit sector and we're a nonprofit professional, or we are uh, an academic uh, and working in, in this space, or we are in the policy making arena and, and making difficult policy choices and budgetary decisions, it is exhausting to be running from fire to fire, zigzag, 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 until we get to a place of safety. Now, the end of the sniper story, before I go on, for those of you who don't know the situation, it was a, a, an adult male and a young, uh, a young man, I think 17 years old, who were the perpetrators. Uh, the adult male was driving a, a car. I don't think it was white. It was uh, some kind of a sedan car. And they, they took the, uh, in the trunk of the car, they, they um, manipulated the, uh, the little button on the back of the trunk. Uh, so the young man, the 17-year-old, was laying in wait in the trunk. Uh, he was able to take his rifle, stick it through the, the hole, uh, and, and fire uh, randomly at people. Uh, ultimately, they were caught and they were prosecuted. It led to a great debate, of course, about the role of the man, the adult, versus the role of the young man, 17 years old, for all intents an adult, but under the strong influence of this grown man. Uh, so that's how that ended. So, but as we think about this, I, I would equate this idea of running zigzag, of this running fire to fire to fire kind of situation as pretty much what we are facing now in 2020. We hear and see online all the time now the comments and, and they're often stated in a very sarcastic way 
with a combination of laughter and tears that 2020 is, is just a remarkable year, right? It's unique, it's horrible, it's horrific. Uh, so many things are happening. Of course, we have the pandemic. We are trying to uh, prevent the spread of COVID-19 in our communities while also being hyper vigilant to prevent COVID-19 from entering our homes and entering our offices. We have the racism and the rallies and the cries and the social unrest, the protests, sometimes violent, that are reacting to racism that we are experiencing in communities throughout the United States. We have on the other side, rallies and protesters who are crying for freedom, concerns that the idea of wearing masks is hurting their ability to be free individuals. We have this tension. The protesters oftentimes meet on the street and violence erupts even further. So 2020 is a remarkable year and we find ourselves running in this zigzag way, hyper aware of everything that is happening, anxious about everything that is happening, but laser focused really on nothing or very little. Now underlying the unrest and the activism is the hard truth that people are hurting. And this is the heart and the soul and the rationale for being in the nonprofit sector. We know people are hurting. People are sickened by COVID-19. People are anguished by the social isolation required by social distancing and the needs to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in our communities. People are hurting as we see them tear gassed as they advocate on the streets for anti-racism and anti-racist policies. People are hurting as we see them denied access to opportunity due to their long-term or long-standing poverty and those who are finding themselves newly in an impoverished situation because of the COVID economy. All of the anxiety that we have as a community is grounded in the fact that people are hurting. And as I think about this, I'm reminded of a story and how people are hurting. It's very reminiscent of the child in the story by the author Ursula Le Guin, the child in the fictional city of Omelas. Uh, maybe some people know the, uh, the story. If you don't, you can go on to Google. Uh, if you're bored by my talk, you can go on now or you can go on later. Uh, go on to Google and look for Ursula Le Guin, L-E-G-U-I-N, the ones who walk away from Omelas. You can find a full text of the story to read. It'll take you maybe 20 minutes to read the whole thing at that. In this story, Ursula Le Guin tells us of this very happy city called Omelas. She paints a picture of uh, people, adults, smiling, laughing, getting along well with each other, with the children laughing and playing games and playing music, the animals in the city well behaved, getting along well with each other, getting along well with their humans in the, in the city. The weather is perfect, the grass is green, the sky is blue, the birds are chirping, everything is perfect in this city of Omelas that you can possibly imagine, except she tells us one child who is hurting locked away in a broom closet or a cellar somewhere. The one child, Le Guin refers to the child as it in the story to emphasize the fact that uh, we are, where the child is, is, is an other in society, is not part of the mainstream in society, is treated as somehow distinct from the, the rest, the majority of the society, it, the child is sitting in this darkened broom closet, prevented from seeing the beautiful sunlight, prevented from hearing the laughter or hearing the beautiful music or breathing the fresh air. Occasionally someone will come into the cellar or the broom closet and throw food at it or kick it. But the rule in the city of Omelas, Le Guin tells us, is that in order for the happiness to exist outside, that one child needs to continue to exist in this terrible 
condition. In order for the happiness to exist outside, this one child must continue to exist in this terrible state. Now, sometimes I tell this story and, and I like to use it in teaching ethics, for instance, and contemplating with my students the idea of the greatest good for the greatest number, right? Is it worth the suffering of the few to, to benefit the many, right? And that leads to really strong and interesting debate, but that's not where the story stops. The story, the title is The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas. So what she tells us after introducing us to the child, the child who is suffering, one by one, the people of Omelas who are aware of their happiness being contingent upon the suffering of a child, one by one, they get up and they walk away. They leave the city of Omelas. They do not talk with each other. They do not speak with their neighbors. They do not confer with their colleagues or their associates. They do not have a community meeting to talk about whether or not they should allow the child to suffer to benefit the many. They just, one by one, individually get up and leave. They walk away. And typically, when I tell the story in the context of uh, giving a workshop or a lecture about citizen engagement or civil society or civics, uh, I, I like to use that as a parallel for what is typically our reality. As citizens in the United States and elsewhere around the world, we do not step up when we see people hurting. We walk away as citizens. I'm, of course, I'm not talking about you. We, in this room, are the exception. The fact that we're staring at each other on Zoom right now to talk about nonprofit leadership and leading our values and acting on our values says that we are not who I am talking about. But the majority of people in the country and in other places around the world are in a position where they are more likely to walk away rather than to deal with the problem that they perceive. And this leads to usually a, a good discussion of uh, how can we change that culture? How can we mobilize people? But something is different in this remarkable year of 2020. Because we are actually seeing people stand up, act up, not walk away, but actually stay in the city of Omelas, stay in the city of Orlando, stay in New York, stay in Portland, stay throughout cities in Minnesota and Wisconsin and Colorado and California. Citizens are saying, we're not walking away. We are going to stay and we are going to address this problem because it is not acceptable to allow the few to suffer, the few to hurt, in order for the rest of us to somehow live what we perceive to be a better life. That is something that is different in 2020. So I would suggest it's time to think about a new chapter for Le Guin's story. Unfortunately, Ur uh, Ursula Le Guin passed away about one and a half years ago. Otherwise, I would love if she could write a new version. What happens to the people who stay in Omelas, who decide it's time to make a change. So the problem, to link back to my previous anecdote about running zigzag, the problem with running zigzag in times of high stress and uncertainty is that we miss the windows to fully act on our values as a nonprofit community. And we miss the moment to step out and to lead forward, as the title of this conference is, to help our communities deepen their commitments to the values that we cherish. And these are the values that we're talking about throughout the day. Social justice, reduced inequality, civility, anti-racism, beneficence, sustainability, and others. When we are running zigzag in times of high stress and high uncertainty, we're going to miss those moments. But what I'm going to suggest here to you today, what I am suggesting to you today, is people are not walking away. We're seeing them on the streets. We're seeing them engage 
We're seeing them ask questions. We're seeing them challenge authority in ways that we have not seen in a long time. And so my challenge to us as the nonprofit community or individuals who are working to support the nonprofit community is how can we bring these newly active citizens, those who are not walking away, bring them into our organizations, bring them in as volunteers, bring them in as donors, bring them in as advocates before we get back to a point of something resembling normalcy. And at that time, I fear it would be too late. This window, I think, is just a window. In a couple of years, when the pandemic is no longer at our doorstep, I think people will start walking away again as a normal way of being. So we have a window that we can use to bring new people into our organizations. Now, specifically, two things are likely to happen when we are in a high stress environment and living in these uncertain times. One, with our organizations and as individuals, the goal is not to transform, typically. Our goal in running zigzag, just as I was running zigzag through the parking lot to get to my car to avoid the sniper, is to be safe. The goal is safety. The goal is not to get rid of the problem. The goal is not to advance or to evolve, it's to get to a safe place. The other thing that we fail to do when we are running zigzag is we fail to see the people who are running around us. We feel like we're running alone. And certainly I felt like that when I was running through the vacant parking lot going to my car when the sniper is potentially attacking. I felt like I was alone running zigzag. I didn't care about the other people. If they get it, I'll read about it, I'll cry about it. But my thought was I am on my own and I'm running to my car, I'm running to that safe space. I don't see the people around me. And that's something that we tend to do as people and as organizations as well in times of high stress and high uncertainty. We do not see the people running near us. And thus we fail to leverage the resources that they have. We fail to partner effectively with them in order to move not just to a place of safety, but beyond safety to fully embrace and live and enact our values. To go beyond safety with confidence. That requires seeing the people around us. So how do we do it? Uh, I have a, a few ideas, and some of them are pretty broad. Uh, and I'm going to end with an idea that will suggest ways that we can take this conversation forward a little bit uh, over the months ahead. Uh, and as we think about commitments that we each individually might make today during this conference, how do we avoid the traps of running zigzag in these high stress times, in these uncertain times. One, we have to see the people around us. We have to slow down enough to observe, and this is a good start right here. Those who are in this conference, we have to see each other, recognize each other, learn from each other, have dialogues with each other so that we can build together and grow together and move beyond safety to a point of full evolution together. Second, we have to look at the people who are active, those who are not walking away, but who are staying and who are organizing and who are protesting and who are letter writing and who are raising money for political candidates and for nonprofit organizations. We have to look to them, reach out to them through social media and through other means. And importantly, we have to accept their passion and we have to be, as organizations, open to changing ourselves based on their passion. Now, there's a lot, of course, a lot of the unrest and the protest and the activism that is happening now in our communities is based on this very real problem of racism and institutional racism and the need to promote anti-racist policy and develop anti-racist policy and rid ourselves of racist policy. As organizations, we cannot close ourselves to that passion, to that advocacy, to that interest. If we invite individuals into our organizations, we have to be open to them asking tough questions of us. We have to be willing to be changed by 
their interests. If they suggest that we are somehow biased, unintentionally biased or discriminatory or racist uh, or in, in either our policies or the implementation of our programs, then we need to be open to change. That's the next thing that I would suggest we need to do. Next, we need to align our organizational missions with the moment. This is a terrible time to go through a full strategic planning process. You never strategic plan in the midst of a crisis because the environment is so uncertain, but this is a time to double down on the values that you have as an organization, to be clear in your mind, to understand what the values are that are guiding your daily behavior. So align your values and your mission with the world as we see it around us to make sure that you are staying true to who you are, but also staying true to goals beyond uh, the point of getting back to a point of uh, normalcy. Open your organization to be to critical review. This is consistent with what I said a moment ago. Uh, if organizations, if you all uh, accept new volunteers, bring in new donors and they want to ask questions, they want to challenge your policies or procedures, let them. Don't be afraid of that inquiry. They are looking for transparency. They are looking for solidarity. Give it to them. Don't construct walls where they don't exist. Very practically, I would suggest recruiting at least one member of your nonprofit board to be what I would call the guardian of your values. Someone whose job it is on the board not to look over your finances or not to look over your leadership structure or not to look over your ethics or not to look over your programs or anything like this. All of that is important, but have a specific person on your board dedicated to making sure you are living and leading through and with your core values. That would be their main purpose on the job, to look at all of your programs, your activities, your leadership, your speeches, your outreach, your communication, to make sure that they are consistent with who you say you want to be as an organization. That's one thing I would suggest very practically. Next, build your social media communications and your social media community, not only to promote yourself, this is typically what organizations do, we do it very well, promoting ourselves, putting our best foot forward, showing how great we are and the great number of works that we are doing and the good works that we are doing. We should celebrate that stuff. You should promote that stuff, but that should not be the only use of social media. Use social media to build community so that you have people watching you from the outside and holding you accountable and ensuring that you are not drifting in directions that are antithetical to your mission. And there's a, a wonderful session that's part of the day later today with two colleagues uh, from outside UCF and Song Hoan is moderating that panel from our faculty at UCF. Uh, so if you have a chance to go to that panel, uh, I encourage you to, to do so on social media advocacy. Keep in mind as you think about uh, the work that you're doing in the community that the nonprofit sector is the most trusted sector in our society. Nonprofit organizations are the most trusted institutions, more than government, more than private businesses, more than big corporations, more than the media. Nonprofit organizations are the most trusted entities in our community. Now, there's some nuance to that statement, and, 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 and we can go into it, uh, but by and large, nonprofit organizations are the most trusted. Use it. Use this fact to be standing shoulder to shoulder in solidarity with those who are on the streets who are working to enact the values that we all subscribe to. Next, and I'm almost done with this list, take risks. Do not be afraid of taking risks with your organization. This is a time for experimentation and exploration. It's our temptation, as I said, in times of uncertainty and high stress, to run zigzag, 
to get to that place of safety as quickly as we can, to get back to a place of normality or normalcy as quick as we can. But it's also a good time to experiment, to try new things, new outreach approaches, new volunteering pitches, new, new donor pitches. Experiment, take risks, try something a little bit different, but pay attention to how well those risks are working. And this is leading to me to my last recommendation, which is to use groups like ours at the University of Central Florida and Valencia College and University of Pennsylvania and uh, Cal, you heard of Cal State is in the room somewhere and uh, Stellenbosch University uh, uh, in South Africa. Use the universities at, in your communities as a resource to help you think through the risks that you are contemplating. Use the universities in your communities to uh, act as, as partners to assess the activities that you are doing and the risks that you are taking. Use the universities to help recruit volunteers for your organizations, to spread your message, to champion your names, because we are partners with you. And as we think about this idea of leading forward, uh, it's a great title and a lovely idea of leading forward, but of course it, it's a play on the phrase leaning forward, all right? To lead forward though requires that we not be afraid of leaning on others knowing that we have partners, knowing that the nonprofit community has a strong partner in universities that should be called upon and utilized. And there are partners throughout the sector with other organizations, with philanthropic organizations, with community foundations and others. Leading forward requires knowing when it is time to lean on others and to use others to move together we do not lose sight of those who are running zigzag side by side with us. So the temptation, as I said, is to run for safety in these moments. It's our job to recognize that though we might want to focus on safety, we need to take these risks. We need to take chance, we need to be bold in pursuing the values that guide us, that lead us all to showing up to work every day, to lead us all to showing up to a Zoom conference on a beautiful early autumn day here in Central Florida. If we don't, if we just run zigzag and we don't pay attention, at best, we maintain the status quo. If we make it to safety only, at best, we maintain the status quo. At worst, we regress, and the core values that keep us strong will be threatened, and we might lose them. We have a small window in this year, 2020, when people are not walking away and we have to take advantage of it. So returning to Omelas, we just have to simply declare that this is the time as a community of nonprofit organizations where we will stand with the community who are staying, who are not walking away, that no child will be sitting abandoned and neglected, will be hurting in order to support others in their community. That we stand with others in order to lift all people up. This is our guiding, guiding principle, our guiding value. And so I'll close there, and maybe I hope I've given some food for thought that will guide us through. Uh, my, uh, my suggestion uh, is uh, by the end of the conference, I'll be joining you again in the last session, if you're still with us, to think about your own personal commitments, what you will do to lead forward, to really recommit to your values, not just within your own organization, but with others, what specifically will you do? I'll look forward to those kinds of commitments uh, as we go through the day. Uh, but uh, as I said, and I can't emphasize this enough, this is a window of opportunity for our community. 2020 and all of its horrors will pass. 
we will get back to a point of normalcy. And that means people will start to do what they usually do, unfortunately, which is walk away from problems that they see rather than engage. We have to act now to bring those people into our organizations in order to lead forward successfully. So thank you and uh, I'll take any questions in our remaining time this morning. Um, good morning, everyone. Just feel free to um, type in your questions in the chat box and then I will read them out. Or if you feel more comfortable just um, asking, speaking out your question, please feel free to raise your hand and we will call on you at that time. Thank you. So I see a question pop up. So I'll, I'll if, uh, if it's okay, Martha, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, yes. Liz please. Buckley is asking uh, first, hello, Liz. Uh, it's nice to, I don't see your video, but I see your name. So hello, Liz. Um, it's uh, nice to, to have you with us. What acts of solidarity could you suggest for nonprofit organizations? That's a great question. Um, and it's it's not an easy question to, uh, to answer, uh, certainly. Uh, and, and I was, in fact, having a conversation very much like this with my PhD students uh, yesterday evening uh, in my class, as we were talking about the role of universities in communities, and the same kind of idea came up. How, what is the role of the university, of a higher education institution, to stand in solidarity with, uh, with uh, those, those uh, groups, those citizens uh, who we recognize as, as moving in a in an appropriate progressive direction to, to guide our, our communities in a, in a, in a positive uh, way forward. Um, and the, the, the risk of, of standing in solidarity uh, is particularly for an institution that relies heavily on government grants and contracts uh, is that you can uh, potentially tick off the wrong people uh, and threaten your organization. So, it, it's, uh, so there's no one overall answer to the question. Uh, the, 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 the sort of the big answer is know your context, know who your uh, budgetary masters are, if you will. Uh, and if there's an alignment, if you have a board who is aligned with you and going uh, and, and, and standing and, 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 and when I say solidarity, I'm saying you, it could be standing on the street. It can be posting on social media messages of encouragement. It can be putting out uh, uh, fundraising pitches on behalf of, of social movement organizations to, to um, move um, some, some of your people to support that organization. Uh, anything like this that can lead masses, lead people, lead voices to that, that, uh, that, that group who are staying in our community and are protesting and are fighting. Um, uh, but keep in mind that, that if, if you don't have a, a board that is fully supportive, maybe you have some corporate members who would be a little anxious if, they, if it got back to their organization that, um, I'm not gonna pick on any corporate name, but if you have a corporation that uh, is maybe a little wary of having their name affiliated with Black Lives Matter or whatever the case may be, uh, then, then you need to be sensitive to that and talk to that board member about what he or she would feel is appropriate for, uh, uh, for the organization moving forward in a way that that um, doesn't hurt that organization. Of course, work with that organization, with that corporation to say, you know, here's why you're wrong for standing in the sidelines, <laughs> right? And you can have that conversation with your board members, with your corporate board members. You can have that conversation with your funders. You can have that conversation with your volunteers. Uh, uh, so, so jumping out onto the street, sending out uh, as a uh, a knee-jerk reaction, a supportive message on behalf of those who are protesting or who are rallying or who are advocating, um, that, um, uh, that's probably not the best thing to do. Be, be strategic about it, be purposeful about it, uh, and, um, uh, and, and, uh, and that'll, that'll make sure for you that you're, um, that you're going to accomplish what it is you actually want to do. Okay, Martha, maybe you can help me out here. I see a number of questions coming in. Uh, so uh, do you want to pick one? Yes. <laughs> sure, sure. I'll go ahead. Um, 
So Lisa Barr wants to know, uh, first, she compliments you, excellent presentation. Who are the best contacts within universities to approach for partnerships, board members, volunteers, and other resources? Um, that's a great question. Um, so most of you are in the Central Florida area, and so UCF is your hometown university. Um, so I can answer very specifically for UCF uh, with the, the general message saying if you are not in a UCF area uh, and you want to work with your hometown university or your most local university, um, the short answer is every place is different and every place will have a different pathway or door and into um, the university, uh, which can be quite intimidating uh, given the size of these institutions. Um, but generally, I would start uh, with uh, reaching out to organizations or units within the university uh, that you would recognize as uh, either providing the skill set you are looking for uh, or the um, um, uh, or have access to students who you might want to use as volunteers. So what is your, your, your purpose? Um, if you're looking for interns, uh, that would lead you to a potentially different office. At UCF, we, uh, the best place for you to go is uh, the host of this very conference, the School of Public Administration and the Center for Public and Nonprofit Management. Um, in addition to these two offices, uh, getting in touch with um, individual faculty who you might know um, or come to recognize, or you can Google search for instance, Danny Siegler uh, and Mirtha, you both are uh, uh, our core in arranging internships for our students with the nonprofit community. So finding that internship director. Um, and if you're looking for volunteers, a lot of universities, including UCF, has a student organization, in our case, called Volunteer UCF, uh, that, um, that that's, uh, can help connect you to students who are looking to engage in community as volunteers. Uh, so we do have those um, those different touch points, um, which to say that to saying that it's itself overwhelming because how, I don't know how many I just mentioned five six different possibilities. Um, so start with one door, and that one door sh should be able to guide you to the appropriate other office. And that one door for you here in Central Florida is right here with the group in this room, the School of Public Administration and the Center for Public and Nonprofit Management. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Bryan. Shannon has a question. She says, any, she wants to know if you have any tips on how you can stay laser focused as a nonprofit leader, and not get distracted on all of the real threats that are out there during this um, time of crisis. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, and and you, you uh, picked up on one of my rhetorical flourishes that lacked in specificity, so well done. Um, <laughs> um, the uh, what I would recommend it's it's really difficult to do because if if you are running and you're putting out fires here 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 it is really hard to slow down and so two things I would suggest the first is the second recommendation I made in that in that little uh, bit of my talk which is to see the people who are running around you uh, and make sure you connect with them uh, because you are all running and you're all hyper aware but you're also seeing different things and hearing different things. So to the extent you can link arms, at least for a short while, still running, but link arms, you might be able to capture uh, uh, areas where you can uh, successfully uh, work together um, in a way that's, that's important, either uh, in maximizing service delivery or in um, creating more efficiency uh, or in making sure that, um, and this is important in the broader context of what I was just saying, if you do have individuals coming to your doorstep online or offline asking to donate or to volunteer, uh, we never in the nonprofit community want to be in a position to say, I'm sorry, I don't have room for you as a volunteer in my organization. If we are linked in arms, I can say, I can't use you, but you know, this person a few arm lengths down from me, they can. Um, so let me point you in that direction and let me introduce you to that person. Um, so that linking arms is, is really important. The second thing I would, I would recommend um, is, uh, and this might not be immediate action, but, um, but, but possibly it can be, is to look to your board uh, and charge someone on your board to get off the race, <laughs> right? Don't, let your, don't, uh, don't put your board in a position of running ragged with you, right? Their, their, their job really ought to be 
maintaining that that focus. Uh, and if if you've got them as a working board, uh, running the race with you, jumping and through hoops, running fires, you know, there might be the chair of your board doing that because you need that person side by side with you, if, or maybe you have a legal representation side by side with you or something, uh, or an accountant side by side with you who's on your board who can help with the financial aspect. Uh, but uh, but otherwise, make sure your board or specific individuals on your board are uh, are are not on the on not, are not on the on the racetrack. They're 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 maintaining that calm. They're maintaining that that focus on where you want to be as an organization. Okay, thank you. Um, Susan Zettler uh, wants to know: Can you provide an example of organizations who are standing with others who are taking advantage of this uh, window of opportunity? Mm -hmm. Um, I can, um, and there, are, I, and and my sense is we'll probably learn some lessons from individuals who are in the room here uh, today. Um, but uh, based on conversations I've I've had uh, in the past month since the pandemic uh, has emerged, um, I've I've been greatly inspired by a number of different um, examples of, of nonprofit organizations here and elsewhere. Um, one that comes um, to mind um, immediately is um, Ebony Nutrition Consultants in the Paramore area. Um, they uh, is, I don't know if anybody is here from Ebony, uh, but they uh, are a, a nutrition uh, focused organization. Uh, they, um, they're, the, the founders of the organization are um, a pair of dietitians, uh, and, and so they really focus on, on healthy eating, healthy um, recipes, healthy cooking uh, in uh, what is, I don't know if it's uh, technically a, a food desert, but very nearly a food desert in the Paramore uh, area uh, without access to fresh fruits and vegetables and healthy uh, food options. Um, so they, they have done some terrific work as an organization um, uh, adapting, partnering, and, and, and um, expanding their area of service uh, in a way that um, didn't shut them down during the pandemic. Uh, it allowed them to stay focused in, in their work um, and, uh, and to uh, uh, adapt their, their basic service delivery model uh, to be uh, responsive in the best way. Um, so that, that's the one that, that comes to mind right away. Um, there, are, there are certainly others. Uh, City of Orlando is just one that we'll hear from a little bit later in one of the panels. Uh, they're another good organization that I, I think has done well in maintaining partnerships. And they have a lot of corporate partners uh, who stand side by side with them as funders of, of their city year program. Um, uh, and there, there are others. I, I, I hate to name names in this, in this very open way as, as good examples for fear of leaving out the people who are also good examples. So I'd, I'd, I'd push back on you to uh, share your own throughout the day uh, and, and uh, particularly in the afternoon after lunch when we get into the more open to conversations. Where are those good practices uh, that you can highlight? Um, and we'll have three of them featured small nonprofit organizations during the lunch period. Uh, that I think we'll learn from. Thank you, Dr. Breyer. There's another question from Isabel Wolf Gillespie. Uh, her question is, are partnerships with UCF and South African NPOs possible? Example, volunteering here or fundraising support? <laughs> Anything is possible. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Yes, and, and we should talk more and we can identify ways that we can formally partner. Uh, volunteering, um, remote volunteering is certainly something that, that we can do. I've, I've long personally had an interest in establishing remote volunteer opportunities for our students. Um, and uh, given the, the virtual nature of most of our work these days, uh, we, we were maybe uh, moving, a, taking a step in the direction that we can more easily facilitate that. Um, uh, and, uh, and also with donations. Uh, we have as in our courses, uh, service learning courses and our master's in nonprofit management program uh, that focus on different competencies in nonprofit management and leadership, strategic planning, fundraising, board development, um, uh, all of these and more. Uh, and uh, we can sit down uh, and get, get uh, your organization uh, together with 
Yang Ju Lee, uh, the head of our nonprofit management program, and, and also the individual instructors teaching our courses to set up a service learning project where students are uh, working to develop a strategic plan for you or develop a fundraising plan for you or a volunteer management plan for you. Uh, these are all uh, possibilities, not just in South Africa, I'll say. Also uh, here in, in Florida, uh, we have these, uh, we have these uh, uh, certain, certainly these uh, potential opportunities. Um, and just to add to or that note, just a, a little side note, I have um, shared my contact information in the chat. I, um, if you're interested in partnering with us on service learning projects, um, internships, or even volunteerism, please feel free to reach out to me. I will definitely make sure that I connect you with faculty as well as students who are um, willing, able, interested in um, building this partnership. Side note, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Briar, do you want to take more questions? There are a few more on the chat list. Yeah, you control the room, you tell me. Okay, there's a question from Dr. Sadiq. He said his question is, if we invite those that state, uh, do nonprofit organizations stand the risk of losing public trust? They may be perceived as partitioned by the public. Yeah, yeah, that, it, it relates to the first question from Liz, uh, to, to understand who our audiences are, who our funders are, who, are, who our board members are, uh, uh, and to take action in a purposeful way. Um, so uh, I'm not suggesting that we all as organizations uh, leave this conference or abandon Zoom right now and go to the nearest protest site. Uh, and, and start handing out our flyers and our business cards saying, come volunteer with us. We have to be more purposeful about what we are um, wanting to do and what we want to do when people arrive with our organizations. Um, so, uh, you know, how we pitch it. So I, I would say if, 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 if you as an organization feel comfortable with who you are and your donors and your, fun and your uh, funders and your volunteers and your board members to put up a flyer that says, we stand with Black Lives Matter. Uh, all who are there, come with us, and here's how you can help shape the world in the way that you imagine it with our organization. Do it. Do that with your organization because that, that's spot on in line with who you are and what you're trying to do. Um, if you have um, uh, mixed funding, donors from different groups, um, be, you just have to be sensitive to that, and you might not do a blast approach of saying, um, uh, attention all Black Lives Matter supporters, come in, uh, or attention all anti-Trumpers, uh, come in, uh, or whatever the case may be. But you might go one by one, individual by individual, uh, with a personal invitation, uh, or going into the social media message boards uh, with your own, um, your own, uh, the identification of your own work, your own operations, the outcomes that you are pursuing with your organization. Um, and, and allowing uh, those who are alert and aware and following uh, to, to find you through your more subtle messaging uh, rather than direct messaging. Um, so, um, so take the risk, but do it in a calculated and purposeful way. That, that's what I would um, suggest. Thank you, Dr. Breyer. Um, we have a question from Martha Stewart. Um, her question is, are there references or handouts available for this presentation? Um, we'll have a video. <laughs> um, uh, beyond, beyond that, um, I'm happy to compile um, uh, some of the, uh, uh, some, some re links to resources uh, that stand behind the words that I used. Uh, and and uh, some, I can do that. And share with, with, uh, with all of you or individuals who are interested. Um, and uh, I, I did not formally type up this, this talk. If you, uh, uh, it was, uh, if you look at my, uh, my desktop computer, you'll see a couple of uh, notebook sized pages that are taped to my monitor. And those were my outlined talking points for this. So I don't have anything typewritten <laughs> that I can share right away, but I can um, certainly provide um, the outline with some links to resources that you'll find valuable. That would be helpful. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. So the room, the room will, um, the session will end in about two or three minutes. I think we have room for just one more question, Kakali, before, yes. Sure. Um, this is from Brandy Maru. I'm not sure if I said your last name right. 
But her question is, uh, what would you suggest to someone who doesn't know where to start being proactive in the nonprofit world? Um, so that's an interesting question. Uh, so if, if you, so we can answer it in a couple of different ways, either that this is um, someone comes to your organization and says, I don't know who you are, what you do, tell me how to get involved, or it's you crafting a message to persuade someone to come into the nonprofit world. Um, uh, you know, lead first with your values. Um, and, and this is consistent with the theme of the conference. Lead first with your values as you, uh, as you communicate or try to educate people about the nonprofit sector and your organization specifically. Um, you know, start with your mission, start with your values. Don't get too heavy into um, nitty gritty. Don't get too heavy into data or statistics. I wouldn't suggest unless you know your audience and they would go for that. Um, but start with your values because this is what are bring this is what uh, are bringing people onto the streets and and who are getting people to stay uh, in our communities rather than walking away right now. Uh, they are guided by values by principles. So lead with the values of what you stand for, what you how you perceive the more perfect world, the more perfect community, more the more perfect neighborhood, uh, and uh, start there. You'll 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 capture their attention and. Uh, uh, and then you can you can wrap them around with uh, uh, ways specific ways they can get involved, um, and we can go on for more time, and, and maybe we will later in the conference or with other sessions. But um, you know, once you once you hook them, right, you 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 need to give them some direction, some action. Uh, if you say come volunteer with us, don't stick this values driven individual into your mail room and have them stuff envelopes right you want to use you know, allow them to use their talents their expertise their passion to do the work that they think is valuable for your organization so really get to know them while also allowing them to get to know you and then you can find an activity that is best suited to uh to uh, uh to their to their passion to their efforts Thank you, Dr. Breyer. Thank you, Dr. Breyer. So it is now um, 1015. So our morning session, our welcome session is actually over now. Um, so the next session will begin at approximately, um, actually in a few minutes. So if you selected the next session, you should have your invites with the select section that you make uh, selected and um, feel free to um, go to those rooms. Any, any closing? Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the great conference. Uh, I'll see you in a couple of sessions and again at the end of the day. And uh, I thank you for the attention and lead on. <laughs>